Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Salt and I'm chair of the Mid Warwickshire Amnesty Group. Many thanks for joining us this evening, whether as one of the 10 million Amnesty members from around the world, or as someone from a like-minded group, or as an individual who's keen to know more about our activism. Um, I'm very keen actually to find out whereabouts in the world or locally you're from. So we're just about to hold a quick poll before we get going. It'll just take 10 seconds. If you would like to record where you're coming from this evening, that'll be great. Thank you. Hi again, thank you for doing that poll. We'll give you the results later on. Um, so you're all very welcome um, this evening. The talk is on modern day slavery and it's one of the many events being held by 40 amnesty groups in central England as part of our festival of social justice, uh, which is running from mid April to the end of May uh, to celebrate the 60th birthday, the 60th anniversary of Amnesty International. I'll hand you over now to our treasurer, Fiona, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jane, and welcome everybody. And a very, very big welcome to our speaker, Simon John, who's uh, really kindly volunteered this evening to give us this talk on modern day slavery. So just to give you a bit of background on Simon, Simon is the secretary of the Thetford uh, Amnesty Group in Norfolk. He co-organised an Amnesty International Forum on the subject in 2015 and is also the global secretary of the Rotary Action Group Against Slavery. Um, just to let you know, Simon is doing a cycle ride, apparently he's just back from a cycle at the moment, uh, from Land's End to John O'Groats um, in the weeks after the talk. And he's hoping to raise money to help the Halia, I hope I said that right, Simon, the Nepalese Untouchables, um who are um out of uh, who are who are in slavery and debt bondage in nepal so i'm sure we'll hear more about that um and a link to simon's just giving page was given in the details of the talk um so just to let you know uh, as attendees that during the event you won't be visible or audible but you may submit questions um which can be found in the options in your control panel so if you click on, there's a little uh, orange arrow that you can click on to expand your control panel if you can't see that. Um, and we'll do our best to give uh, as many questions as we can to Simon after his talk. So I think that's everything from me. So uh, Simon, if you're ready, Jane and I will disappear and uh, over to you. Thank you, um, Fiona. Uh, and uh, and thank you very very much indeed for inviting me to your festival um i have been an amnesty member for almost exactly i think 50 years um but uh, and i joined amnesty as i expect most of us did uh, because we hoped that we might in some small way make a difference that those letters that years ago was what amnesty members did and and less of course internet action because it wasn't there um that those letters would have an effect and there's a lot of evidence that indeed they have um but uh i'm 
I also want to tell you about um, modern slavery and what effect the effectiveness, if you like, of participating in the public arena um, on the issue of modern slavery. And to do that, I just want to give you an analogy or, or if you like, tell me, tell you how I know. Um, I spent um, 60 years, um, I have been 60 years a lawyer, and I dealt with a very particular narrow field of law, and that was trying to achieve justice, um, civil justice, on behalf of clients who'd been catastrophically injured. Um, and to do that effectively, I needed to understand what was, if you like, a soft target, an achievable aim um, with a defeatable opposition. There's no point in me wasting my time and my client's time on a case that I'd never win. So it was all about honing your skills in identifying cases you can win. Well, it only struck me actually last week that um, although, as we know, human rights action generally is effective, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind in such skill as I've generated over 60 years in identifying who against whom we can win, that there is one opponent in the area of modern slavery who's a much, much softer target than your average Minister of the, Minister of the Interior, um, Minister of Justice, uh, President in, let's say, Egypt or wherever else. But let me come back to that. Hold that in your mind, though. Um, there are some soft targets out there, and I'll explain why. Um, we, we just need to move on, actually, through these first through few slides, if you don't mind. Of course, slavery is wrong, and that unanimous post-war document is, of course, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I didn't realise until I um, looked at it again that, in fact, it was the second substantive article in UDHR, um, which uh, gives or prohibits modern or all slavery um, and that the slave trade in all of its forms should be abolished. Um, it, it comes immediately after the right to life. And the reason it's so high up in the pecking order, if you like, um, is that slavery um, both uh, abolishes life, it kills people quite quickly um, because of the appalling conditions in which people uh, have to survive. Um, and it, um, it, it also breaches several other covenants, several other articles in UDHR, such as the right to free movement um, and the right to choose an employment and so on. Um, so just moving on rapidly, could we could we move on? That's it. And a couple more um, quite quickly, because uh, I think most amnesty members um, would would know this stuff. Um, of course, looking at the uh, preamble that we're about to come to, um, you will recall that disregarding contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts. Well, of course, many of those barbarous acts um, included slavery. N next slide, if we can. Next couple of slides, please. Um, and moving on to the right to cheap goods and services. Where's that in UDHR? Well, of course, nowhere. Um, and yes, one more click. Who is it that pays for the labour? What is it that makes goods cheap? The labourer, of course. It's not the manufacturer. It's not our great and glorious government. It's the labourer. It's the unpay of the labourer. The fact that the labourer is not being paid. Um, yes, can we move on again, please? 
so a definition of slavery um, the short definition is just by reversing those three lines those three definitive lines um, it's the violent control by one person of another with a view to the economic exploitation of their labor for profit so violent control for profit um, it involves the loss of effective free will i'm hoping that after this talk we will be um, looking at our neighbors um, and i mean that in the broadest sense rather more carefully and and discerning with a woman's intuition whether they can walk away certainly that well-known saying of edmund burke's applies to modern slavery um, as much as anything uh, because of course we are in civil society largely standing by and doing nothing we are not rescuing slaves how could we rescue slaves by doing the very thing they can't and that's calling the police when we know that they are being enslaved um, and what we are doing is perpetuating slavery I i've come to understand um, when we buy goods that are have slavery in their footprint we are of course uh, being the demand side of this evil trade like every other trade it has a demand side and a supply side there's an ample um, supply of slaves and we only need to think about all those countries um, that we're working in um, where people are doing their best to escape from um, become refugees and thus become very vulnerable there are we know um, more refugees and uh, people driven out of their homes than at any time in history so move on please um, so it, it helps i think just to look at um, slavery um, in in uh, and some allied terms so i've just defined um, modern or contemporary slavery human trafficking is a term that's often used interchangeably with uh, modern slavery particularly in the united states they almost exclusively use the word trafficking when they mean slavery and the media fall into this trap as well uh, but in fact um, it doesn't take a lot of thought to realize that trafficking is actually about movement and that is the movement of people um, out of freedom into slavery or between slavery jobs people smuggling is really just a contract um, it may be a contract that's broken uh, by the smuggler um, it's just a contract to get um, let's say me across a border when i don't have a passport or when i don't want to use that passport um, and uh, slaves can be and are regularly smuggled but so are um, economic migrants um, refugees and asylum seekers um, cheap labor um, is sometimes mistaken for modern slavery and it may or may not amount to it depending on how the degree of underpay involved child labor is frequently uh, slavery but when it is it's often referred to as the worst form of child labor what's wrong with child labor of course in addition is that the child doesn't get an education of which it needs um, to progress and not be vulnerable um, but it's also good to look i think at, at transatlantic slavery and modern slavery and compare the two um and look at the differences and look at how they're similar of course it was illegal we know and, and it, sorry it, it is illegal and was legal then uh, we know that um over a 350 year period until the middle of the 19th century about um 12 to 13 million people were trafficked across the atlantic from africa 
um, in the bottom of horrible boats in which a third of them died. Um, but um, I'll come on to the number of current slaves, but remember that 12 and a half million was over 350 year period. Um, and so not very many, maybe my maths told me, um, taking account of life expectancy, something like 40,000 slaves at any one time. Of course, that was only one part of slavery taking place at that time, but it was quite a substantial part, I think. Um, the markets and locations of slavery have, of course, changed uh, dramatically, as has all industry, um, has all labour. And uh, slavery is, of course, nothing other than forced labour. So the type of labour that's being undertaken will have changed along with everything else over that period. The tools of enslavement are quite different. Uh, no longer do you see men in the high street um, in manacles and leg irons uh, and being whipped. And they're not necessarily black people. Um, as then they certainly mostly were in the new world. No, today the tool of enslavement is just the mobile phone. I'll come to explain how in a minute. But then if we look at the essence of modern slavery um, or slavery as a whole over the entire history of slavery, what is its dominant purpose? Why is it there? Well, it's about money, isn't it? It's as simple as that. Um, and the degree of obscene profitability, the standard of, uh, and we know that, of course, um, the, the degree of profitability um, aided just recently by the National Trust when they said, um, yes, actually, a very large number of these um, houses littered around the countryside to which you may have been uh, dragged by your parents, as was I, um, uh, were built from the obscene profits of slavery. Um, this, uh, uh, today, um, slaveholders don't tend to buy very expensive houses, uh, so far as I know, but often invest their ill-gotten gains in large numbers of very expensive motor cars, maybe because they're more marketable. Um, the standard of treatment of a slave was and is appalling. Life expectancy is quite an interesting, slightly academic measure, if you like, um, but slaveholders in the days of transatlantic slavery needed to know what return they were gonna get on their investment in buying for a lot of money a slave. Slaves are dirt cheap today in comparison to um, the transatlantic period of slavery. They needed to know, um, and their accountants needed to know, what return they were gonna get on the slave. How long was the slave gonna live? And the answer then was seven or eight years. Today, it may be eight or nine years, but it's not a fat lot different. If you look at the fact that many, not all, but very many slaves are taken at the time of, if you like, peak production, um, in their early teenage years, when they're strong and um, able to work long, hard hours, um, the, the, um, the, the period of life expectancy won't extend much into their 20s. Um, and in one field in particular, in, sec in the sex slave industry, what a thought that there should be an industry around sex slavery, but there is and a highly profitable um, sector of the, the already profitable, obscenely profitable slavery industry it is. The average age of entry into the sex slave industry in the United States is 11 years of age and the life expectancy is between three and four years. Um, but you only need to look at the degree of disregard and contempt for human rights uh, to see how uh, nothing has changed. 240 years ago, there was a slave ship called Zong, an African name, no doubt, because it was engaged in the Middle Passage. Um, and 
in that year, 1781, they made navigational errors. Um, they and they put the wrong destination, no doubt, in their sat nav, and the the net result um, was that they were facing uh, severe shortages of food and water. So what did they do about it? They threw overboard 133 of pieces of property so they thought actually human beings we know and they knew too really 133 slaves thrown overboard um, william turner the famous seascape painter was moved to recreate the scene and you can see his signature sunset um, approximately in the middle of the picture um, and in the foreground the flailing helpless arms of the drowning slaves. But things, um, as the French say, plus ça change, plus ça même chose, that the more things change, the more everything stays the same. And it was only 18 months ago, wasn't it, that we were struck with this image on our screens and learned that people, smugglers, likely enslavers, the prosecution never got to prove it, but actually likely enslavers because they were Vietnamese, uh, and we'll hear in a minute a bit more about Vietnamese, but they are one of the um, higher numbers of populations in the UK slavery population, which by the way, is 136,000 in the UK. You will hear gov government figures of 10 to 13,000, which are about seven or eight years old, and to which the government desperately clings, because if they were to admit um, what the UN estimates are the number of slaves in Britain, along with, um, let's say, 400 and, uh, I think 8,000 in the USA, for example, um, so they're vaguely consistent there, um, they would have to do a lot more about it, uh, but they don't. But just going back to the, um, uh, absence of concern for human life, for human rights. How easy would it have been um, to uh, open those doors, but they didn't. And so here are the number of slaves. Remember 40,000 or so um, in uh, transatlantic slavery and uh, today 40 million, not 400,000, not 4 million, but 40 million um, and, and there is the distribution and now let's look at a, a short movie from the renowned American photographer Lisa Christine um, who will um, just give you some example of where you find slaves when you look for them. I've been tricked by false promises of, of a good education, a better job, only to find that they're forced to work without pay, under the threat of violence, and they cannot walk away. Today's slavery is about commerce, so the goods that enslaved people produce have value, but the people producing them are disposable. Slavery exists everywhere nearly in the world, and yet it is illegal everywhere in the world. In India and Nepal, I was introduced to the brick kilns. The strange and awesome sight was like walking into ancient Egypt or Dante's Inferno. Enveloped in temperatures of 130 degrees, men, women, children, entire families in fact, were cloaked in a heavy blanket of dust while mechanically stacking bricks on their head up to 18 at a time and carrying them from the scorching kilns to trucks hundreds of yards away. Deadened by monotony and exhaustion, they work silently, doing this task over and over for 16 or 17 hours a day. There were no breaks for food, no water breaks, and the severe dehydration made urinating pretty much inconsequential. So pervasive was the heat and the dust that my camera became too hot to even touch and ceased working. 
Every 20 minutes, I'd have to run back to our cruiser to clean out my gear and run it under an air conditioner to revive it. And as I sat there, I thought my camera is getting far better treatment than these people. Back in the kilns, I wanted to cry. But the abolitionist next to me quickly grabbed me and he said, Lisa, don't do that. Just don't do that here. And he very clearly explained to me that emotional displays are very dangerous in a place like this, not just for me, but for them. I couldn't offer them any direct help. I couldn't give them money, nothing. I wasn't a citizen of that country. I could get them in a worse situation than they were already in. I'd have to rely on free the slaves to work within the system for their liberation, and I trusted that they would. As for me, I'd have to wait until I got home to really feel my heart break. In the Himalayas, I found children carrying stone for miles down mountainous terrain to trucks waiting at roads below. The big sheets of slate were heavier than the children carrying them. And the kids hoisted them from their heads using these handmade harnesses of sticks and rope and torn cloth. It's difficult to witness something so overwhelming. How can we affect something so insidious yet so pervasive? Some don't even know they're enslaved, people working 16, 17 hours a day without any pay. Because this has been the case all their lives, they have nothing to compare it to. When these villagers claimed their freedom, the slaveholders burned down all of their houses. I mean, these people had nothing, and they were so petrified, they wanted to give up. But the woman in the center rallied for them to persevere, and abolitionists on the ground helped them get a quarry lease of their own, so that now they do the same back-breaking work, but they do it for themselves, and they get paid for it, and they do it in freedom. Sex trafficking is what we often think of when we hear the word slavery. And because of this worldwide awareness, I was warned that it would be difficult for me to work safely within this particular industry. In Kathmandu, I was escorted by women who had previously been sex slaves themselves. They ushered me down a narrow set of stairs that led to this dirty, dimly fluorescent lit basement. This wasn't a brothel per se, it was more like a restaurant. Cabin restaurants, as they're known in the trade, are venues for forced prostitution. Each has small private rooms where the slaves, women, along with young girls and boys, some as young as seven years old, are forced to entertain the clients, encouraging them to buy more food and alcohol. Each cubicle is dark and dingy, identified with a painted number on the wall and partitioned by plywood and a curtain. The workers here often endure tragic sexual abuse at the hands of their customers. Standing in the near darkness, I remember feeling this quick, hot fear. Uh, at the very beginning of her talk, uh, Lisa Christine, that's with a K, Christine, um, spoke of the deception, um, next slide please, spoke of the deception which um, people suffer and, and that is how they end up in modern slavery. Um, they're not stupid, but they're desperate and when you're desperate, um, you will buy the most unlikely story. Um, the absolutely typical European story um, is into sex slavery. And the technique is quite simple. Um, you're a girl and suddenly you find yourself with a handsome new boyfriend who declares undying eternal love. Um, and, um, and then, quite quickly, 
he manages to find for you a great job in London that a friend of his has found and you're going to um, go and work there and earn money for both of you and you're going to be able to live a great life and you're going to be able to send money home to your parents as well so much will you be earning and you'll be able to go to school on the side um, and so on of course it's all a lie you, when you when you land by easyjet at stansted or wherever from say eastern europe um then you are your your passport is um is kept um i'll 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 keep that because um, I know the procedures and when you'll need it next and so on. And then as soon as you um, get outside the airport, um, you're sold there and then. Um, and your former boyfriend lover hands over the passport to the person who's going to be your sex slave master um, for the next Lord knows how many years until we rescue you. Um, and and it's just like um, the situations she has described and, and they cover all sorts of work. Here in this slide um, are the Halia um, that, that we heard about at the beginning who've been trained by Anti-Slavery International um, to, to avoid falling into modern slavery, actually in this case out of slavery, the children in particular are trained to avoid it, to avoid and understand the hard sell of the people um, who just want to sell you. And this lady's been um, enabled to access microfinance. We're going to need to move on a bit more quickly, I think. Um, so uh, these are the occupations. Um, I'm sorry, this slide appears rather small, but um, or rather the text the font um, but do look at that film um, shady chocolate um, which gives the lie to the story told by the big chocolate companies who have a non monopoly um, of the cocoa in the ivory coast um, and they dictate the um, rock bottom price um, which is so low that the farmers in the Ivory Coast can't afford to buy their labour. So what they do is they go out into neighbouring countries and um, fool people. It's always the same story. Fool people into a great life down in Ivory Coast, which actually turns out to be 17, 18 hours a day um, working in a cocoa plantation and being locked into a corral at night and fed scraps and you can find it on youtube um, and it's called shady chocolate and it gives it a lie to what the chocolate industry said they were doing but they've been rumbled again and once you've got that basic formula of how you fool people into slavery uh, just apply it across the board to the textile factories of bangladesh to the construction sites all over the world, to the brick kilns that we've seen um, in Nepal, to the mines in the eastern part of the DRC, um, the Congo, um, to uh, fisheries in Ghana, domestic work all over the world, um, to sweatshops, um, and see the full film, which is on TED. Um, you know, TED Talks, um, and it is it's very, very powerful, that Lisa Christine film. Um, and they're forced into sexual exploitation, begging, petty crime. Um, and as you know, um, particularly in, um, in Nigeria, um, by Boko Haram, they're forced into being child soldiers, um, soldiers' wives, uh, porters, you name it. And it happens closer than you think. Um, there's an especially nasty video, um, which I commend to you on YouTube, called Grooming Young People is Big Business to This Man. Grooming Young People, Big Business to This Man. And it is near us. It's very close 
here in Kingsdown School in Swindon, um, there are uh, there were 40 children uh, enforced into uh, a county lines drug gang running drugs as mules, if you like. Um, and the, 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 the method is only slightly different. This is where the mobile phone comes in. Um, these are usually vulnerable children, so carefully selected because of their vulnerability. Um, and uh, often single parent women um, and the, the mobile phone comes out. If there's any threat of misbehavior on the part of the slave, we know where your mum and your little sister live. Um, and, uh, and, and this is what they're going to get with a quick show of the knife or whatever. Um, and this is what the police say about this type of slavery and all types of slavery. They, if you go on their websites, are begging for our help. That may seem counterintuitive somehow, um, but they're begging for our, our help. And they say to us, this is the colossal, the freedom of these slaves, is the colossal difference that can be made um, by giving us just small bits of information. You don't have to analyze and come up with a verdict on what you found. If you think it's a bit iffy, tell the police through the Modern Slavery Helpline. And here are all the ways in which slaves are close to us at home. And then on the next slide, we'll see how they're not so close, but they're in the footprint of the goods that we bought, especially food, electronics in our smart devices, um, and, uh, and, and especially in fast fashion, internet porn, and so on. Um, so just moving on to the next slide, and the next slide again, of course we're only one, but we can make a difference. Um, the numbers, apart from anything else, are massively in our favour. Um, there are nearly 8 billion other human beings, aren't there? Just to spot 40 million slaves. Well, um, I haven't done the maths actually, but it's probably like something like 10,000 to one, is it? But it's certainly a very big number that it only takes a few of us to spot somebody who's enslaved. And we'll come to how to uh, quite soon if we could um, move on, please. Um, sorry, yes. Um, so here we are. Never buy, uh, and and I probably don't need to tell Amnesty members uh, many of these. Never buy knockoff goods. Um, they seem like a laugh at the time, don't they? But they're actually made by child slaves. Um, fair trade is not perfect, we keep being told, but it's the best we've got in an imperfect world and it has allowed millions to go to school. That website, ethicalconsumer.org, um, you can get some information from free, but if you pay 29 pounds a year, um, you'll get full guides on the complete range of goods and services. There in quotes in the last two lines, are the headlines of that Guardian article about what's going on in the Ivory Coast um, with child slaves um, being duped to go and work down in the Ivory Coast. Um, and you can you can drill down to the lawsuits of the sorry to the website of the American law firm that is bringing um, this uh, lawsuit that's referenced there in. Um, Washington DC and you'll be referred to the other piece of litigation going on in California and in that Californian case which has been around for many years it's been stalled on the grounds of jurisdiction in other words is it permitted to bring the case here in America the court having already made findings of fact in favor of the child slaves that they were so treated. And these are other things you can do. 
uh, in particular, learn more, spread the word, um, choose an anti-slavery organization and support it. Thank you. Um, and of course, challenge and shame corporate power at the bottom. Um, corporate power, and I come back here to the soft target, corporate power is our equivalent of the Minister of the Interior, the Minister of Injustice, um, the President, the Prime Minister of whichever country we're writing to. But what's soft about corporate power is that they depend on us, on us buying their goods. Soon as we stop buying their goods and tell them why we're buy no longer buying their goods and that we've told all our friends that we're not buying their goods and you're talking about it everywhere that you're not buying their goods and nobody is, they will see their sales drop and ouch, that's vulnerability for you because their salaries depend on you buying their goods and everybody buying their goods. And the less people that buy their goods, the more vulnerable they will be and they will change their behavior. Remember what happened to fur, the fur industry, happened almost overnight. Uh, people said no to fur. Well, we can say no once we discover um, what goods have slavery in their footprint, I suggest. Thank you. Can we just move on? Yeah, so here in a mobile phone, and I'll distribute this, there won't be time to go into all of them, are a whole series of apps, the free apps that you can download. Um, the first one comes from Unseen, and the fourth um, call is from an organization called Stop the Traffic and they're both brilliant at spotting the signs. The second and third, Safe and far Farm Worker, they're excellent in those specific situations. The last one, um, maybe the best of all, the Gicky app. Get them all, please, but you'll be astonished by the Gicky app. Permit it to um, use the camera on your smartphone and Immediately when we finish, go to your fridge and take out something with a barcode and scan that barcode. And in a speed, with a speed that defies logic, it'll come up um, with a score and feedback on that product. Um, and we'll give you good alternatives. And I'm sure, like me, you will find that you're buying some horrible stuff that isn't doing either the planet, which of course, in the end, impacts on the vulnerable and slaves, as we know, and Amnesty, of course, acknowledges. Um, and it'll give you alternatives. It'll give you great alternatives, as well as information about the ethical sourcing in terms of slavery of that product. And good on you is the same except for clothes. So I think this brings us to the last slide, um, which is, um, if I remember correctly, the starfish story. Um, a, a slight uh, variation I learned the other day of the starfish story. So you probably know it, young man walking on beach, which is littered with hundreds of starfish who are dying because they're out of the water. Um, following a, a very rapid outgoing tide. And there's a little old lady at the water's edge, leaning down, picking up starfish and throwing them back in the sea. Um, there's only one of her and there are hundreds of starfish. So the young man um, goes up to her and says, well, jolly good try, but what possible difference can you make? Because there are all these hundreds of starfish. Um, so she just leans down, um, and uh, picks up another couple and throws them back in the sea and turns to him and says, well, I hope I made a difference to those two. Quick as a flash, the young man gets out his mobile phone onto social media and within a few minutes, loads of his mates are down on the beach, all throwing starfish back in the sea. So not only 
can we do something on our own? We know that. That's why we're amnesty members. Um, but by spreading this message, um, we can make a big difference. We are asked to set the downtrodden free and neutrality, as Desmond Tutu tells us, in the face of injustice means we have taken the side of the oppressor. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Simon, thank you very much. Um, I know you wanted us to leave some room for questions at the end. We haven't actually had any questions sent in just yet, but um, I'll just talk for a little while. Um, anyone who's been attending who'd like to ask a, a question, if you would like to go to that orange box of the arrow and put your question in. Um, meanwhile, you might have seen the results of the poll. Uh, about a third were from Warwick, about a third from the rest of the Midlands and about a third from the rest of the UK. Um, I know people from Wales and Norfolk and the north of England were going to join, so that's really nice to have had you all here this evening. Um, uh, I will be handing back to Fiona shortly to, to say a proper thanks to you, Simon, but I would just like to remind everyone that our talk is just one of many taking place in the Festival of Social Justice. If you'd like to know of any other talks, please Google Amnesty Festival of Social Justice and they will all come up with the links. And there's also a YouTube uh, link to the Festival YouTube channel with pre-recorded content. Please have a look. Um, don't forget also, Simon is doing a cycle ride from Land's End to John of Groats. Uh, he's just been training before this tour. Yeah, you are still doing it, Simon. And he's got a Just Giving page uh, to help those people in the Halea community in Nepal who suffer from uh, descent-based um, slavery. Um, and before Fiona does her thanks, I would like to thank behind the scenes people that nobody's seen this evening. Uh, Paul and Anne, thank you so much. Um, they are the tech people that have spent a lot of time setting this up in the weeks leading up to this um, and the quarter of an hour before our talk this evening and they're also facilitating the Amnesty webinar to several other groups. So all of this wouldn't happen without them. Thank you very, very much. Paul and Anne. Um, so I can't see any more questions have come in. So um, Simon, is there anything you want to say before Fiona finishes? No, I don't think so, except that here is one of the human worst human rights abuses in our time, certainly in terms of numbers. Um, and it's simply begging for action by um, Amnesty members as good citizens. And I love the fact that you've given that phone number. I hope everyone's put it in their phones this evening. If you see something, the number to ring is 0800 121 700. That's 0800. Actually, one... actually sorry, Jane, it's 08000. 08000, sorry, 08000, yes. thank you. 121. One, two, 700 and i think you've said somewhere simon in one of your pieces of paper i've seen that the police would rather you ring and be wrong rather than miss something and they might have other pieces of the jigsaw to put together to go and investigate something so don't be frightened yeah. to ring that number uh, and i think i've sent to you haven't i um, a couple of supporting documents which you're going to distribute to people that have got all yeah. of the websites and things on them Yes, people from groups, um, representatives of other amnesty groups who contacted me and I had their email addresses, I will send those documents to them. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. Over to you, Fiona. Um, thanks. I do really just want to round the evening off um, by, yes, saying a massive thank you, Simon. Um, it's a subject that I knew a bit about, but I feel now so much more informed. Um, but even more than that, I sort of feel I have a to do list of things that I'm going to go away and do. Um, it was not 
you know, it, it really touched me emotionally. I'm sure it did everybody who watched the talk tonight and has really sort of spurred me to action. I think um, the thing you said, learn more and spread the word everywhere. I'm certainly going to try and do. Um, and, you know, boycotting Nestle and Mars. Um, that's it for me with those two. Um, watch the rest of that TED talk. I'm going to join ethicalconsumer.org. Um, and 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 download some of those apps. Um, so thank you so much for not just giving us a really informative talk, but also um, letting us know sort of what we can do about it. So um, yeah, thank thanks. you. And in fact, a couple of comments have come in. Um, thank you very much to Gillian Davidson. She was just asking Simon, what will the money go towards? Um, that that particular project in Nepal. Um, which involves outreach workers going into villages and um, empowering people who are slaves to free themselves. Um, it, it's an interesting fact that in the deep south of the USA, um, during the period of slavery, it was um, a very serious offence punishable by imprisonment to teach slaves anything to educate slaves. It takes one to know one. In other words, clearly, if they thought that was so powerful and would be um, the keys to their freedom, education and the realization, the understanding of their position in life, of their rights, is so obviously um, the, the vaccine against slavery and so anti-slavery international understand. Thank you. And then the last comment is from Kate Sheringer, and it, it isn't a question, it's just a comment saying thank you very much for an interesting talk. And she represents the Cardigan and North Pembrokeshire group. So thank you. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.